we're in the second of a four-week series that is based on our church's mission statement. We began last week by looking at the Old Testament passages in Deuteronomy and Leviticus that serve as the foundation of that mission statement. Now, both of those passages are found in three different places in the New Testament. In the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus makes reference to these words in the last encounter that he has with his opponents before he's arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane. In the Gospel of Luke, this proclamation of the greatest commandment is one that leads to a question that Jesus is asked by a lawyer, who is my neighbor? And it is that question that serves as the springboard for Jesus' telling of the parable of the Good Samaritan. And in Mark's Gospel, these Old Testament verses are found in the section that we focused on throughout the season of Lent this year, Jesus in Jerusalem during Holy Week. So the basis for this series and the basis of our mission statement are words of Jesus that are based on words of the Old Testament. And since we have spent so much time in Mark's Gospel since the beginning of the year, let's use his account as we look at the specifics of our mission statement. In the 12th chapter of Mark, we hear these words. And one of the scribes came near and heard them disputing with one another, and seeing that he answered them well, he asked him, which commandment is the first of all? Now Jesus answered, the first is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And the second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Now, having looked at the Old Testament basis for our mission statement, and seen how Jesus utilized those passages from the Old Testament in the New Testament, let's begin our examination of each of the three basic components that are found in our mission statement. And today our focus is on loving God with all our mind, our heads for Christ. Our scripture reading is taken from first letter of Peter, reading from the third chapter, verses 13 through 17. First Peter 3, 13 through 17. As we consider the three components of our mission statement, heads, hearts, and hands, this first one, the head, may seem to be the least important of the three. Now, it may not seem as crucial as those parts of faith that we would deem more lofty. Now, prayer, worship, and the emotional fervor that is represented by the heart, or the practical and valuable service that we render to others represented by our hands. Now, the first thing to say about that is that all three of these are absolutely essential to a well-rounded Christian life. And secondly, without this first one, without knowing and understanding what it is we believe, the other two are meaningless. And prayer, worship, and a passion for spiritual growth mean nothing without a basis for our investment of the heart. And we would have no burning desire to give of ourselves for others without a foundation for the work that we do with our hands. And that basis and that foundation begin with what we know and what we desire to know. In essence, it does all begin with our head. I remember a church advertising campaign a number of years ago. We used a, a picture of Jesus, and underneath that picture, there was a single line. Jesus came to take away your sins, not your mind. And I think that's brilliant, and it is so true. For thinking and learning are vital, a vital component to a well-rounded Christian life. 
Now, there are literally, literally dozens of passages of Scripture aside from the one we read this morning from 1 Peter that are making this same point. And when Jesus met the disciples following the resurrection, Luke says he opened their minds to understand what the Scripture said about him. And the writer of the letter to the Hebrews, speaking for God, said, I will put my law in their minds. The Apostle Paul tells the Christians in Colossae to set your minds on things that are above. And in his theological masterpiece, his letter to the Romans, Paul says, be transformed by the renewal of your minds. Now look at some Christians today. You'd think that Paul rather said, be transformed by the removal of your minds. That's not what he says, though. We are to remove our minds and our thinking. We are to renew them. And I suppose at this point, you would expect me to quote all of the depressing statistics about how biblically illiterate we have become in today's society and the meager percentages of people who are familiar with even the most basic passages of Scripture. Well, I don't have to do that. Because on a, a day when we celebrate the achievements of our children, our children in Bible memory work, you have already been made aware of that, haven't you? Now, the purpose isn't to make you feel guilty about what you don't know, or to feel guilty about what you're not doing, but rather applaud you for what you do know and applaud you for what you are doing and encourage you to do even more of it. Now, remember this. You're a Presbyterian. Now I say that because it means something with regard to this. Presbyterians have always, always placed a very high emphasis on education in general and particularly Christian education, arguably more than any other denomination. Now here at East Mister, we have as outstanding a Sunday school program as you will find anywhere in any church of any size. Some of you may remember the old Joni Mitchell song, Big Yellow Taxi. And a great line in it, don't it always seem to go, you don't know what you got till it's gone. Now we have had countless individuals who have left here and then come back to tell us that they didn't realize what an outstanding Sunday school program we had until they went somewhere else. I applaud and encourage your continued support and participation in that great program of Christian growth. And I think one of the real strengths of this church, one of the real strengths of our educational programs is found right within our mission statement that we just read this morning. It says, we respond to God's grace by loving one another while recognizing that we have differing theological expressions of shared core beliefs. Now that naturally begs the question, what are our shared core beliefs? You now virtually every Sunday, we use in worship a creed. Now, for the last couple weeks and for another couple weeks, we will be using our own mission statement as that proclamation of what we believe. But ordinarily, we use either the Apostles' Creed or the Nicene Creed, or we use a portion of one of the other great creeds in the history of the Christian church. And those creeds contain the essence of our shared core beliefs. We believe in one God. We believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who died that we might have abundant and eternal life. We believe in the Holy Spirit and we believe in the forgiveness of sins. You see, these are the core beliefs that center us. One of the great privileges and joys of being part of a church family such as this is that we have a level of love 
and trust and respect for one another and that enable us to engage in thoughtful and challenging dialogue about very important matters of faith. And we enter into that dialogue open to the possibility that we might be wrong about something. And as we very genuinely listen to what others have to say, we may change our mind about an important element of faith, or at least grow in our understanding of why someone has a belief that is different from our own. You see, that kind of dialogue here, that kind of dialogue that we have within the community of faith enables us to go out into the world and to have that same kind of conversation with others. Now, the approach we take here is the approach that we should be taking in the world. Engaging in conversation with love and with respect and with trust for the views of those who think differently from us. And notice what Pat Peter says in this passage. Always be prepared to make a defense to anyone who calls you to account for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and reverence. Now let me offer you three very simple suggestions for growing in this first component of our mission statement. First of all, make reading the Bible a part of your life every single day. It may seem obvious, and it is. Use a devotional guide if you feel that you need a regular discipline, or simply leave your Bible by your bedside. Read it every morning and or every night. And the more you do that, the more comfortable you will become with it, and the more you will grow in your Christian faith and your understanding of God's Word. Secondly, read the words of others. Read books by leading contemporary, trustworthy Christian scholars. Read the works of someone like N.T. Wright or Luke Timothy Johnson. Or read the works of those of a generation past. Read everything written by C.S. Lewis, including the Chronicles of Narnia, for a very fanciful examination of the Christian faith. And finally, make a commitment to be a part of Sunday school. You've heard me say it before, and I will say it again. That, in my estimation, is the very best way to be challenged in your growth and Christian knowledge and understanding. Now, I think there are two possible stumbling blocks that we encounter in following these three suggestions. And ironically, those stumbling blocks are really polar opposites. You may not read your Bible, you may not read the words of others. You may not attend Sunday school, first of all, because you're afraid that you don't know enough to do so. Please do not let that stop you from doing any one of the three. Every one of us is growing. We're all growing, and we all have to start somewhere. Now, the second stumbling block is that you may think that you already know everything there is to know. You may think that you already know everything that you ever want to know about the Bible. You may think you may know everything that you ever want to know about the Christian faith. Don't let that stop you either. I previously told you the story of Frank Stagg, one of the great New Testament scholars of the 20th century. And Dr. Stagg was a professor at the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary in Louisville when Emma was a student there when I took classes there at Southern. And one day, Dr. Stagg came racing into the classroom, books under his arm, and he went charging to the podium with great intensity. And a class of more than 200 students sat there looking at him, wondering what it was that had him so worked up. And he dropped his books down on that podium, and he looked up at that class with great excitement. And he said, I was reading our passage for a study for today, and I saw something that I had never seen before. Now here's a guy 
who had been teaching New Testament at the seminary level for more than 40 years. He was near retirement. He was considered one of the great New Testament scholars of his generation. And yet here he was saying, I was reading our passage for study today and I saw something that I had never seen before. And if someone like that is committed to remaining open to new insights that he might gain from his study of Scripture, none of us should ever feel as though we have in any way arrived in our Christian knowledge and have nothing more to learn. It's the first component of our mission statement is absolutely vital, and it serves as a foundation for the other two. We serve and celebrate with our heads, being open to everything that God would teach us. Amen.